Hey, it's Mac, and I am here with some first impressions of the Forever Winter. This is an early access game that launched just a couple of days ago on September the 24th. And as I said, I'm here to give you uh, my first impressions after uh, just uh, about four hours or so of uh, playing the game over the last couple of days. And hopefully also give you some insights about a couple of the more notable issues being discussed in the community. Uh, just a quick reminder that this is not a review. Uh, I've live streamed this game for uh, about two hours and you're seeing a lot of that footage in the background now. Um, so uh, I played uh, all on my own, a solo, even though this is a co-op game that supports up to four players. And uh, yeah, uh, this is going to be a fairly long video, but I'll try to keep it as tight as possible. And uh, do check the timestamps in the description below to jump to your uh, most important topics. So uh, yeah, let's get right into it. Um, so what is this game? First of all, uh, The Forever and Winter is uh, a survival horror uh, shooter stealth game. Yeah, <laughs> it's set in a post-apocalyptic future where humanity has been decimated and uh, the world is essentially dominated by three warring factions and they are continuing to make war with each other uh, uh, over the, the blasted remains of humanity. And you as the player play as a scavenger, you're just a... Uh, survivor trying to trying to make ends meet, trying to put food on a table, trying to survive day to day. And uh, the game is developed by Fundog Studios. Uh, the studio is made up of uh, veterans from the AAA gaming space. Uh, so uh, these these people have worked at uh, AAA studios in the past, and they all decide to uh, break off on their own to kind of free themselves from the. Uh, business and commercial restrictions of working for large studios and they want to make their dream game so um right off the bat i want to talk about the art style and the atmosphere of the forever winter i feel like this is the the big selling point of the game right now uh the art style the visual design and the music are the number one selling points of the game. it's a linchpin i think it's really uh, factored heavily in the way they've marketed the game and marketed the early access to uh, their existing fan base and, and to newcomers as well. It is really so detailed and evocative, uh, the art style of this game the, and the general um, look of the world. Um, they, they make use of a very good um, environmental storytelling as well. They do a lot with a little. I should add that the uh, musical tracks are all uh, very catchy. They're, like, they're all kind of dark and uh, dark, a little bit depressing at times, uh, dark and foreboding for sure. Uh, it, it just perfectly captures the bleakness of the setting, right? And although in my playtime I've only focused on two of the regions or two maps, uh, I think the environments are just beautiful. I I'm sure there's a lot more eye candy in store for me, but of the two regions I've been exposed to so far, there are like these shattered war-torn landscapes. And they're just amazing to look at. And by the way, the, the sky boxes are just amazing. Excellent. So th those are like the visuals of the aesthetics out of the way. Let's talk about uh, the gameplay loop. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you play as a scavenger. You're a small fish, you know, a scrappy survivor uh, fighting for scraps in a war-torn post-apocalyptic hellscape. It's all about the survival. It's all about your survival, getting your basic needs met. Uh, you start in your home base, which is called the Innard, and that's located underground. Uh, there you outfit yourself with equipment, weapons, and supplies. You can pick one of five scavenger characters to play with. Uh, you select the quest and you uh, pick a region in which to do the quest in. And then from there, you group up, you group up with other players or you can hire NPC helpers to join your party. And then finally, you deploy out to your uh, mission, or as they call it, a raid. And that's where the meat of the game is. Um, when you go into a raid, you, you pick a region or, or what's, you know, they call it regions, but they're basically maps. 
and you'll have multiple entry points uh, which will change your spawn point on the map and it may alter certain parameters of your of your uh, quest such as what type of extraction you'll deal with they have two types of extractions that i know of one is like a standard one where you have to just get to a specific point and hit the button and then you're you're done or there's a time distraction so once you activate it you have to wait i believe a minute before you can safely exit the map and during that time enemies will flood towards you so you have to survive uh your quest task um pardon me your quest will task you with finding supplies uh with water being a, a key resource and once you found what you need you must uh, safely extract uh, how do you go about your raid is up to you and it will be based on which scavenger you're using whether you're playing solo with bots or with other humans and uh, how capable you feel in the face of conflict generally uh, stealth is crucial because you're not a trained soldier or endowed with any superhuman abilities uh, you're just massively outgunned, right? So you don't want to get into fights most of the time. You want to actively avoid conflict. Uh, each region will be procedurally populated with combatants that come from three of the main warring factions. Uh, enemy units on the field will operate with their own agenda, run unique patrol patterns, and assess threats differently depending on the situation. They don't take kindly to seeing your scavenger walking around in the open and will typically attack on site unless, unless there's a greater threat in the immediate vicinity. Your goal is to get in and out safely. So long as you can extract, you get to keep whatever supplies you picked up along the way. If you die, everything you came into the raid is lost. Uh, so basically anything you brought to the mission is, is lost with the exception of some default guns and ammo as well as anything you picked up during the during the run. But if you return safely back to your base camp, you can stockpile the supplies you found, you can sell goods to the vendors for cash, and you will maintain a healthy water supply, which is very important, and I'll talk more about this later. Let's talk next about the uh, game feel. And for that, I wanna actually switch to a different uh, set of uh, gameplay footage so here we go um, game feel so the the game is really based around stealth and uh, i feel like it takes a lot of inspiration from the survival horror uh, genre uh, movement is uh slow and cumbersome it's it's clearly a design design decision uh, to uh, portray yourself as uh, as a malnourished survivor and you're carrying a massive backpack all the time. They call this a rig. Uh, but I will say, even though it's it fits with the lore, it fits with the theme of the game, the execution of the movement still needs quite a bit of work. Uh, it just feels extra responsive. Unresponsive, I should say. It's easy to get snagged on geometry in the environment. Uh, such as small rocks or bits of uh, you know, metal or rebar sticking out of the ground. And uh, it's not like there's a game where you should be looking down at your feet. You want to have your heads up on a swivel, being very aware of your surroundings. So constantly getting snagged on geometry is really, really annoying and can lead to your death, quite frankly. It's also difficult to tell when you're standing or crouching due to, I guess, the way your scavenger looks you're kind of wearing like a lot of baggy clothing and you have this huge rig on your back and it sort of masks like your posture in the heat of the moment so sometimes when you're moving when you're walking which is slow it looks almost as if you're crouch walking very subtle difference and i think this could be fixed if they had like a small icon on the heads-up display to show your crouch state and this is actually like a, a convention that's been used in other games, such as military shooters. Speaking of shooting, uh, the shooting suffers from similar sorts of issues as movement does. Uh, it's kind of clunky. Uh, I just don't like the third person view and how it transitions to a first person camera when you, whenever you aim down the sights of your guns. 
I really don't like that system. Uh, funnily enough, you can tab out of the game and then tab back in while you're in uh, during gameplay. And you can force sort of like a bugged version of a third person aiming camera. <laughs> but it doesn't last. And uh, when you try to fire again, it doesn't really work very well. Um, but you know, I want this to be uh, actually a permanent feature where you can just stay in the third person when you're moving around and also when you're aiming your gun. Um, this whole uh, third to first person camera transition, I can learn to like this uh, system, but they need to really tighten up the controls and make it smoother. The shooting controls overall need to be better for me to really get on board with this uh, third person, first person system. I mean, they can put in a toggle so you can choose which way you wanna do it. And there can be gameplay trade-offs for using one camera mode over the other. And that'll be fair, right? And just leave it in the player's hands to maybe have that choice. Uh, so long story short of the shooting, if they can just improve how the shooting feels overall, and tune the sensitivity sensitivity of the first person ADS. That'd be great. And then they can also work on a proper third person aiming and, sh and a shoulder swap mechanic too. That's that's something that I would really like to see. In terms of um, how the game is with their user interface, uh, the UI I would say is at once minimal and kind of busy. So we just look at the heads up display while you're in a mission, while you're doing a raid. Uh, the, the HUD is solid and it's fairly clean and uncluttered. Uh, some of the menus, when you're back at the home camp, uh, you're dealing with your loadouts and uh, you're, you're um, having interactions with the vendors. That stuff is a little bit cumbersome and busy, um, especially uh, when using uh, an Xbox controller, which, which I am using. I, I play with a controller exclusively. Um, I think the design of the looting and inventory management UI is uh, very much in the spirit of games like Escape from Tarkov. So it might be an easier transition if you're familiar with that, with that game or other extraction shooters. Overall though, I would say there's no glaring issues as of yet. Uh, but I'm sure to uh, develop a, you know, a pretty healthy list of complaints once I put more hours into this game. I did mention the controller support and that I'm a controller player. Uh, right now it's functional and uh, I'm not too worried about it as long as they keep refining the controls uh, over time and not completely forget about it as they're busy, you know, crushing bugs and working on like bigger issues. Uh, I, I have good faith that uh, the controller support will, will get up to, to snuff because there's some, there's some weirdness here and there. Uh, one, one major complaint I have with controllers is that when you're sprinting, it's a standard uh, move the left click the uh, left stick forward, uh, you click it in and you move forward and you'll sprint. Um, I would prefer if you only need to click in the left stick once to initiate the sprint. Right now you have to hold the, the, the button in as you're moving forward. So you have to keep it pressed down as you're moving the stick forward. Uh, whereas if you just click it once and move forward, that is more of a modern implementation that we see in other uh, shooters. And I think that will work a lot better. Um, I'm also still trying to figure out how to give commands to my AI teammates. I think it's supposed to be bound to the uh, D-pad on the controller, but I haven't had any luck controlling my teammates around. And finally, I would say the controller mappings in the in the menu settings, uh, they, those need to be updated for sure because all the labels are vague and unfinished. I haven't got too much to say about uh, how the game is when you're back at the home base, the innards. Uh, I would say it's like a well-rendered home base, uh, very, uh, very highly detailed. It's not too big or sprawling, but you know, with the way the character moves, it seems bigger than it actually is. And uh, the good thing is you can actually pull up the main menu and fast travel to any of the major hotspots in your base, such as like the various vendors, your character loadout, the water supply, what have you. And I think after the first few minutes of just walking around uh, manually, 
uh, I just I just resorted to uh, using the menus to move around because it's just kind of tedious with how slow the walk speed is to just move from location to lo location within your base. Okay, so within the base, you have a place where you uh, keep your water supply. And there's a water supply schematic that is like very important to the game. So this has caused some controversy within the uh, Forever Winter community, and I'm going to deviate a bit from uh, from the first impressions nature of this video to just talk about this very quickly. So what the concept is here is that uh, water is the lifeblood of your home base. If you neglect your water supply, you will die. And the water supply will deplete in real time, like real lifetime, not just in, in, uh, in game time. And uh, water is kind of measured in jugs. You, you'll find jugs of water when you're out on mission. So one jug equates to one day of water supply for your base. Once the water supply runs out, all of the scavengers in your base will die and you will lose all the equipment and loot you are storing at base. The only thing you will re re retain are the XP you've earned and the skill progression you've uh, unlocked. Now the reason they've done this, the devs want to maintain a certain level of... Um, they want players to be anxious about getting back to the game and feel a sense of anxiety. This is something that they've uh, expressed. Uh, and, uh, you know, when it comes down to what they want to do, uh, I guess, the goal of the aim uh, with this mechanic is essentially just the main, a certain level of retention for their game. Uh, it's in everyone's interest, really, to maintain a healthy player base, a healthy base of active users. Um, because the game has co-op as a key feature. So they want to have, yeah, basically for matchmaking, for grouping up, enough players playing any given time that, uh, you know, they need, they need these daily active users coming back to the game, maintaining their base. Now, they have to be careful with implementing a retention mechanic like this because the developers have marked themselves as how would it say, like the people's champion or like the champion of the common gamer. Uh, they've kind of been very upfront about being, uh, they want to be consumer friendly with their business practices. And uh, to me, that, that means that they're not going to implement features and business practices used by most other live service or free to play games. And when I say that, I mean things like battle passes, season passes, and even like more, innocuous things like daily logging calendars. I think most uh, people here, uh, especially those who are, who are familiar with mobile gaming, know about these things. The water supply, the water supply mechanic that they're doing is, is a very thematic and helps encourage daily sessions without overly, without overtly doing all these gross sort of things like battle passes that other games do. But the problem is here is that battle passes and daily login rewards, these are FOMO mechanics that are generally based around rewarding the player. Uh, the problem with the water mechanic is that it's all stick and no carrot. Uh, so the devs have mentioned that there's you know daily equipment donations that you that will incentivize you to come back to you to play the game and check in on your base. Uh, for myself, I don't know how that works yet. I think it's more based around you having co-op partners for you to do trades with each other. So I would say on this, uh, they're already making some changes based on what I've read on the community discord. But I would say that um, the devs should really consider positive incentives, positive reinforcement, and rewarding the, the players for consistent daily or weekly play. So they're gonna be anything from like small boosts to scavenger faction reputation, vendor discounts after achieving a streak of daily logins, or you know, yeah, daily logins is actually what it is. Um, you know, the sky's the limit. They can get quite creative with this without having to resort to battle passes and tacky things like that. Uh, they want to keep the game serious and very player friendly. Uh, they should just think about more positive reinforcement instead of just like this threat 
having your uh, having your whole base wiped if you don't play for a certain amount of time. Now, apparently, it's not too hard to keep a healthy supply of water, but you know, it's back to the whole like carrot versus stick paradigm. So that's all I gotta say all about the water supply mechanic. I'm not too stressed or upset about it. I just want to see how the developers incorporate the feedback and make positive changes. Now, how does the game perform? Stability-wise, I've only had a few incidents of freezing. There's a known issue involving the Elef Elephant Mausoleum map that the devs already plan to fix very soon. And so the game freezes, all you do is like tab out, close the game and just restart it. Uh, apart from that, it's been surprisingly stable for me, but this can vary wildly. As I know, players on the uh, Forever Winter Discord have reported you know, crashing or not even be able to run the game even with recommended uh, PC specs. Uh, and I'm not going to list out all the bugs I've run into, but I may kind of like go through some of the more notable, noticeable bugs later on in the video. As far as performance, um, my PC specs are actually closer to the recommended that they have on the Steam page. With one exception, I was worried because I have a Ryzen 5 7600X, which is a six core processor. And on the same page, as a minimal requirement, they list an eight core CPU if you have an AMD processor. So I was kind of fooled into thinking that this wouldn't be enough and that I would be prevented from even running the game. Well, turns out that you know not all six core processors are created equal and mine is fine um, because all the other are all the other specs on my PC are on point and, and just fine. So on medium graphic settings, I average around 70 frames per second to maybe low 100s, but it really depends what I was doing and where, you know, where, which map I was playing and the general activity on screen because you can have like a huge raging battle going on and that will dip your frame rate for sure. In terms of bugs, um, I don't have a huge laundry list of bugs. Um, I think anything that has to do with freezing or crashes obviously needs to be dealt with. Um, a lot of it was just little inconveniences like continuity problems or progression issues. Like I would think I would like bring in certain items on my loadout, but when I would go into um, the actual mission, they would be missing from my inventory. Um, so most of the time it's just like minor stuff. I would actually like to just focus more on wrapping up the wrapping up my first impressions and just talk about like what I think the devs can focus on going forward. And this is purely my opinion. So I have like my sort of like top recommendations for what they could do in priority order. So I'll kind of categorize things if, from like a, a P0 to P3, P0 being like DEFCON 5, like get this fixed ASAP. Uh, P3 being more of like, well, you know, these are important things, but you can fix them over time as the early access progresses. So P0, I definitely have improving performance and stability. And uh, there's uh, no issues right now with matchmaking and grouping up. Those of course have to be fixed ASAP because grouping up to form a little fire team it is like a, a core feature of the game. Next, next up are the P1s. Uh, P1s, I'd say, would be sh things that should be addressed within the next month or so. Uh, I'd say these include uh, improving the movement controls, improving the feel of the shooting, which I've already gone through, uh, continuity or progression related bugs, um, and anything to do with like the AI, how the AI behaves. There's a lot of glitchy AI behavior and uh, how the AI spawns in the missions because sometimes RNG will kick in and they'll just spawn really close to you as soon as you start a mission or you'll have a raging battle just right next to where you came in on a map. You're, set, you're essentially stuck and can't move because as soon as you pop your head out, you'll aggro something and then you're toast. Next are the P2s. P2s, I would say, should be addressed within the next like one to two months. These are very important things, but they're not like code red. Uh, under this, I would just, I would say the devs should decide on how to rework the water supply mechanic. Um, 
and, and truth to be told, this this could be iterated on for the entirety of the early access period. If that's how long it takes, right? This is something that they can just sort of tweak. They don't have to make a definitive rework and just stick with it. They can just keep making fine tweaks to the water supply mechanic. And I think over time, they're going to arrive at a, at a happy compromise between wanting to pull you back into play every day or every week and making it not so punitive so that if you do get busy and like, hey, you just want to play some other games for a few weeks, you don't come back to your game and just lose everything. Uh, another P2, I would say, is to add an option to toggle the third person mode for shooting. And of course, the shoulder swapping mechanic, which is, uh, I think, high in the list on the community wish list. Uh, finally, let's talk about the P3s. Uh, these are just like fixes and refinements they can, uh, they can, and they can, you know, you know, do as they go along. They're not like the number one thing, but there are things that should not be ignored before the game goes into 1.0 release. And uh, there's probably like a huge laundry list of quality of life improvements that the players are, are submitting as feedback. Deal with the quality of life improvements as P3s, uh, the inner customization options and, and major additions to customizations, those can be put into the uh, work on it as, as, as it comes up list. And uh, finally, I would say the meta objectives which is just like the overarching point of the game. Right now, I'm not seeing like the the overall goal of the game. It's just, to me, it just seems like day-to-day -day survival. I, I'm just surviving day-to-day -day for what? At the end of the, at the end of the, all that. I'm doing all of this because dot, 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 you know? Survival is not enough for me as a player. I kind of need to know what is the end goal here. Is there an end game? Uh, or is it just like, yeah, just keep doing runs, picking up supplies, slowly upgrading your, your weapons and your scavengers, and then that's it. You know, that, that could be fine, but that could also get old after a few months. So to close, um, my general thoughts on the Furrow Winter, is it fun? Do I feel like investing more time in it did meet my expectations? Uh, I'm having fun with the game right now. Uh, the feelings I get from playing it are very similar to how I feel when I first start playing Dark Souls games and similar games in that genre. It's brutally difficult and can feel very unfair. Um, the AI is wonky. Enemy awareness view can feel very inconsistent. And how they spawn into the map can also be extremely unfair. And uh, just subject to like the rule of the dice, really. Like in old-fashioned survival horror games, simple things like moving or firing a gun all feel kind of gimped in, in multiple ways. Uh, and on one hand, it makes me feel like, you know, I'm much more inferior to the threats around me. And it discourages me from being too aggressive and careless. But on the other hand, it just doesn't feel good to play a lot of the time. So they uh, find a better balance. And I, I will point to examples like the Dead Space series for, you know, still being very much survival horror games, but also making you feel like you have a lot of agency and it, you feel somewhat competent, you know? Uh, I, haven't, I still haven't tried to play any co-op. I'm, I'm more of a solo player and I would like to try out the co-op. But right now, I honestly don't know if that's really going to improve my experience that much due to stealth being such a key gameplay mechanic. If I play co-op, that's just more bodies in a group, which increases the chance of one of us pulling aggro. And sure, if that happens, then there's more firepower, uh, more firepower in the group with which to fight back. But you know, at the end of the day, fighting is not the point of Forever Winter. Maybe in the more advanced quests and regions, there will be uh, more emphasis on group play or on larger scale battles, but I'm not even anywhere close to that point, uh, if that does exist. So I, I wouldn't know about that, but we'll see. Now for, I guess the ultimate question and the ultimate purpose of me releasing this video, I kind of want to try to answer the question of like, should you buy the Forever Winter game while it's still in early access? 
I would have to say you have to be uh, uh, very forgiving of bugs and forgiving of jank, you know, which is that popular term everyone uses now to refer to general bugginess in games and unpolished features and mechanics. I mean, it's true though, you should be willing to participate in community discussions and report bugs. Since the whole point of early access is to help the developers improve the game before it becomes a final finished product. You need to think of it as a stealth game first, uh, a survival management game second, and maybe a shooter third. This is not a third person action shooter, not at all. Uh, you should be prepared to prepared to fail and you should keep an open mind and be willing to learn. Uh, if you can do that, this game could be for you. And if you're down with some of the, the other points I mentioned, like if you're down with the bugs, you're down with uh, reporting bugs and uh, talking with the community and talking with the devs, then this game could be for you, you know? But if you're still not sure, keep in mind that Steam's refund policy also replies to early access games, right? You get two hours of playtime, or you can have the game sit in your um, in your games list, in your games library for up to two weeks. After that point, if you play more than two hours, or if it's longer than two weeks, then you can't get a refund. But until then, you're free to get a refund from Steam, so it shouldn't be any sweat off your back. If the game crashes on you, you'll know right away. If you just hate so many parts of the game that you can't stand playing it, then hey, you have at least two hours to figure that out. And if all else fails, if you're still not sure, you can just wait for the free demo, which the developers plan to release sometime in October, which is, you know, pretty, it's coming up. October's around the corner and uh, you won't have to wait long. So that's really it for my first impressions. It seems like it's a lot more than my first impressions, but honestly, I've only put four hours in the game so far. Most of the time, I just been falling on my, falling on my ass and failing horribly. As you can see in the uh, gameplay footage here. Uh, but I'm still learning and I'm still wanting to jump back in and to give another shot. I'm trying to learn the first map as well as I can. And so get to the point where I can do very efficient runs, grab the water, extract, you know, do it with minimal resources invested and, and start building up my base. I'm excited at the prospect of, you know, building my base and getting better at this game. So. That's it for my first impressions. I really hope you got something out of it. Please do all the usual great YouTube things. Uh, drop me a like and subscribe if this video has pleased you. And, uh, you know, leave a comment on this video because I love reading your comments. Let's talk about this game. Well, I've had fun giving you my first impressions. You take care out there. Stay safe. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now.